Well, it's good to see those who are here this evening, uh, and uh, those who are listening, we welcome you as well. Um, if I can get my, there it goes. Uh, nice to get the technology to work uh, so that the Bible opens. Um, we are in Luke chapter 19 tonight. Uh, as I, as uh, we said earlier, that we are approaching the end of this study. And so uh, it's, it, it is the time uh, when we should start thinking about where we're going to go next. Uh, and so, we, uh, the Lord willing, should we not uh, miss any weeks for snow, we have now five weeks uh, following tonight. Uh, to think about that. If there are any ideas, just bring them to my attention. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long study. It could be a short study. It could be a topical study. It could be study from uh, uh, a book of the Bible. We've done both of those. Uh, and so uh, uh, if, if not, I, I will suggest a couple uh, in the next few weeks uh, uh, as the new year uh, comes around. So we are in Luke 19. And as we've done so many times, we're going to deal with the context or the background of this parable. And the background of this parable was some thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Let's get verse 11. Henry, why don't you get verse 11 of Luke 19? Now as they heard these things, he spoke a last parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and because they saw the kingdom of God. Would appear immediately. Okay, so let's keep that in our minds. As uh, Sometimes when we go into the parables, we try to get lessons out of the parables that really aren't there. Uh, sometimes they might fit. Sometimes they might not fit. The entire reason why Jesus taught about the parable of the pounds, uh, which is the parable tonight, is because people thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. What, is the, what, what do you think people's perception of the kingdom of God was at that time? Not maybe what our perception is, but maybe what, what do you think they were expecting? Earthly kingdom? Probably an earthly kingdom. Now, how many times did they, did they try to make Jesus a king by force? Uh, the Jews were looking for a messiah, that was going to end Roman rule, it was going to bring in a kingdom uh, of, they thought, an earthly kingdom. He, the Messiah, would rule uh, as king, and basically uh, uh, the world would be at peace. In other words, you would have no more war, you'd have no more, uh, no more sorrow and pain. What did Jesus teach his kingdom actually was? It was a spiritual kingdom. It was not going to be a physical kingdom. It was not going to be a kingdom on this earth. There are people today, many denominations teach that there, we are awaiting a kingdom on this earth. Despite the fact Jesus said that there would be some people who would not die until they saw the kingdom of God come with power. The kingdom has come. But Jesus was teaching this parable uh, because there were people who were confused. They thought the kingdom was going to immediately appear. Now, the kingdom was going to come. It was going to come within some people's lifetimes. It may not have looked like um, people expected. But Jesus' parable was trying to teach something that was trying to change this idea that the kingdom would immediately appear. And so let's read verses 12 to 28. We'll read four verses each. We'll start with Bill and then go to Tammy and up and around. Did you verse 12? That verse 12, right. yes. Uh, so he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minus and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered the, the, that these slaves, to whom he had given the money, 
he called to him so that he might know what business they had done. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit, and reaping what I did not sow. Wherefore, then, uh, then gave not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with interest. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him uh, the pound, and gave it to them which has ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he has ten pounds. For I say to you, that to every one who has will be given, and that for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine, did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. When he had a salary, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. All right, so this is the parable. Now, I do have one thing that, that I heard. I think I heard it in every version but mine. Um, people, sometimes the versions try to make things simpler by taking concept we do not know and making it into a concept that we do know. Now this parable is known as the parable of the pounds. What are we dealing with? Money. We're dealing with money. I know what a pound is. We still have pounds today. We could sort of envision. I don't know what a mina is. I really don't. Uh, I've heard I've heard this called the parable of the minas. Uh, that doesn't sound like money to me. Now maybe it's a translation thing that I just don't, don't understand, but uh, I do understand pounds. This is dealing with money. And so we have this story that Jesus was telling. A nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom. So, sorry, what? With 60 shackles. Yeah, like as far as he, 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 went, he went in to receive this kingdom. And he was going to return. So in other words, the people, this is, remember, we're dealing with people who thought the kingdom should immediately appear. And so, there's this number. Before he left, he called ten servants and gave each of them a pound, or a minor, uh, to trade and conduct business with while he was gone. So, in other words, the, the person was going to go away, but he still had business to conduct. Uh, so, he, he gave ten people the different, uh, the different things. And he said, uh, occupy this till I come. What did, what did the citizens do, though, when they heard, uh, when, sorry, when, uh, per, when he returned, having received the kingdom? What, what did the citizens do to this nobleman? According to verse 14. They hated him. They hated him. Okay, yeah, they, they said, we, we, we don't want him to reign over us. Uh, so keep that in your mind about there were people who, who, who were given responsibilities, and then there were others who were just normal people that didn't want this nobleman to reign over them. What, happened, what did the first servant do with his one pound? What did he do? Verse 16. He earned ten more. He earned ten. He, he, the first came and said, Lord, your pound has gained ten pounds. So he gained ten pounds. What, what was his reward for doing that? <laughs> well, but he had ten cities. He, like I said, that was a reward. You have authority over ten cities. So in other words, this man has this kingdom, and he comes along and says, Wow, you did very well. You're going to have authority. It's not that you had... That you had it is work. I'm not saying it's not work. But he is he's saying he's getting a reward. It's like getting a promotion. Uh, you, you did well over this, now I'm going to put you over this section of my business. 
Oh, so, in other words, he had this vast city. You're going to be a governor over 10 cities. In other words, you have shown uh, res that you are responsible and that you can work and you have gained a lot. So I will put you in responsibility over a lot, over 10 cities. What happened to the second servant? Five pounds. Yeah, he got five pounds. Now, did he get rebuked for only making five compared to the one who had ten? No. No, the, 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 the man was still pretty happy with him. What did he get? What was his reward? He had five cities, so he gained five pounds. He gained five cities. Uh, so, in other words, he had, he had his reward, too. Now, was it a lesser reward? Well, people might say, well, it's a lesser reward. I, I hear some things that are taught from this parable that are sort of like what last week's parable dealt with, that, uh, that there are different areas of heaven, and some people get better rewards than others based on what they do. I don't think that's what this parable is teaching. But uh, the, the, man had, the, the nobleman had the right to give the reward as he saw fit, just like last week. What happened to the third servant, or at least one of the servants? Because we're not dealing with all ten. We deal with only three of them. What happened to that last one? He did nothing. He did nothing with it. He didn't even put it in the bank. Uh, he, he did nothing. He, so it gained nothing. Why did he do nothing with it? What, what was his reason in verse 21? He was afraid. In other words, this is very austere. He was a very strict man. In other words, the man didn't want to take a risk that he lose the money. He thought, he thought, well, if I go and if I go and invest this money and lose the money, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. So, because investing money and, and it involves taking risks. People invest in the stock market. They invest in different things. You're not guaranteed to get the money you put in. You could lose money. And this person thought, well, this person takes up what he didn't lay down and reaps what he didn't sow. And therefore, if I lose money, I'm going to get in trouble. So I'm going to take the safe way up. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to do anything. Therefore, I know that he will have his one pound when he returns. I can give it back to him. No harm, no foul. What did the Lord say to this servant? What did he call him, first of all? What type of servant? He was a wicked servant. You wouldn't have thought he was a wicked servant. He didn't lose the master's good. Now, he didn't gain him anything either. Remember, that's what the task was. The task was to go out and use it. So the man here didn't follow what the master told him to do. We might say, well, he didn't lose it yet, but he was told to go out and invest it. He was told to go out and do something with it, and he did nothing. So he didn't obey the master here. Uh, but but what, what, was, what, what did he say if you didn't want to lose the money? What should this man have at least done? Put it in the bank. Got interest. Now that that's that's somewhat foreign to us today. There's there's very few bank accounts that you can put something in and gain anything. You might gain uh, today the, the master might ha might get a whole three or four cents uh, if he's lucky. Uh, but you would gain interest. You put it into a place where, like today, we might say, well, you put it into a GIC. A GIC up here in Canada is a guaranteed interest certificate. That means. You're gonna, if you put in a, a, a dollar, you're guaranteed to make whatever the, that is plus the interest. You're not going to lose. It's not a, you won't get that much because that's the safest investment. But at least the man, if he'd have put it in the bank, would have made his master something. It wouldn't have made him a lot. It wouldn't have been like the guy who got 500% return with 5 pounds or 1,000% return with 10 pounds. But he might have gotten him 1%, 2%, maybe, and brought something back. 
What did the master do with that one pound? Gave it to the one who had ten. Gave it to the one who had, who knew what to do with it. Now some people objected. Says this man already has ten pounds. What was the Lord's response then? That every one which has shall be given. And from him that has not, even that he has shall be taken away from him. What the Lord's saying is, if you're given something, and you're not going to do anything with it, it's going to be taken from. And if you have something and know what to do with it, more is going to be given. You're going to be given more responsibility. In other words, there are some people who are just more capable. But we are all capable of doing something. This third servant here was capable. He was, it was sort of a cop-out. I was afraid. Well, we can't come to the Lord and say, well, I was afraid of you, Lord. That's why I didn't do anything. Well, God's not going to accept that excuse. Uh, we, we need to work. And uh, that's the whole point of this parable in one sense. When, 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 when the, the master said, do something, we better do it. So what was the last thing the Lord commanded? After he had dealt with the, the servants who had done righteously and the servants that had done wickedly, what did he do about these servants that didn't want him to rule? Destroy them. Destroy them. In other words, he's going to deal uh, with the people who didn't want him to be their king. So in other words, he dealt with the people who he had given instructions to, and then he dealt with the people who didn't want the kingdom to begin. That's the parable of the pounds or the parable of the minus. So now let's go and delve into our lessons. And there are nine of them that we are going to look at. First of all, as we had said, the parable of the pounds is the first and foremost trying to teach about the kingdom not beginning while Jesus was walking among the people. The, the nobleman here went to receive a kingdom and then returned with the kingdom. So in other words, Jesus was going to go away to receive the kingdom. The kingdom is here now. He's going to return again and deal with the people who he gave instructions to, and he's going to deal with the people who didn't want him to be king to begin with. He's going to deal with those two sets of people. When he returns, we're all again in this parable, some way, shape, or form. John and Jesus both taught the fact that the kingdom was at hand, but that the kingdom would be in the future from their standpoint. It's not in the future from ours, but it is from theirs. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. I think we're to Bill. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And in those days cometh John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. One more verse, yeah. Verse 3? Yeah, you can uh, get verse 3. For this, <coughs> for this is he that was spoken of through Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ye ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Okay, so John the Baptist's purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord. He was going around teaching the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the phrase. What does it mean for something to be at hand? Close. It's close. It's not now. The kingdom of God is not now, well, at least when they were preaching. Uh, when they were preaching, the kingdom had not yet come, but it was close. The time was at hand. In other words, they weren't going to have to wait much longer. Jesus taught the same thing. Tammy, you want to get Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same thing. John and Jesus both taught the same thing. The kingdom of God was close. But the New Testament, if you read it all the way through, teaches us that the kingdom did not come while Jesus was here on earth, but the kingdom has come today. The kingdom is here. Jesus is going to return sometime, 
that's going to be the second part of this parable uh, when he when he deals with the people. But he had the kingdom when when he returned in this parable. The nobleman already had the kingdom. He didn't come to set up his kingdom. His kingdom was already there, and he came back to deal with these people. And so let's read some verses from uh, the book of Acts. Now, I mean, you want to get Acts one. Verses 3 to 5, 6 to 8, and 9. So Acts, five, or Acts 1, 3 to 5, then 6 to 9, really. Or I guess it's 3 to 9, if I, I separated them. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many priests, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said... You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Okay. The kingdom still wasn't there in Acts chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Jesus was still here. And the apostles asked, Are you now, is the kingdom going to be now? And Jesus says, Not for you to know. But he did sort of imply there that you, when the Holy Spirit comes, then the kingdom will come. Then that's the kingdom. Uh, and he said it's not going to be many days from now. But he ascended to heaven. He's not here. That's when he ascended. And so the kingdom still wasn't then, but it was coming. It was still at hand. Henry, do you want to get Acts 2, verses 30 to 32? Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with him to him, and over the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseen this, spoken concerning the resur resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Okay, Peter is using the same language Jesus used in Acts 1. You're going to be witnesses of me. What were they witnesses of? Well, they were witnesses that he was raised from the dead and that he ascended to heaven. He is sitting on his throne. What does sitting on his throne imply? He's king. He's king. There's no throne without a kingdom. You can't <laughs> sit on a throne and not be king. Uh, and so if there is a throne, there is a kingdom. That means now the kingdom has come. The kingdom up until that point had not come. It was not going to appear while Jesus was on this earth. In the parable of the pounds, the kingdom was not there until the nobleman went, went away to get it. It wasn't there, but it was coming. Uh, let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Bill, you want to get Colossians chapter 1, verses 12, 12 and 13. Yeah, I'm sorry, I skipped that one. Colossians 1, 12 and 13. Um, giving thanks unto the Father, who made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who delivered us out of the power of darkness <clears throat> and translated us into the kingdom of of the son of his love. Okay. He translated us. What does it mean to be translated? A couple things you could say. If you're a math teacher or if you're a language teacher. It means the same thing though. Moved us, changed us. Moved us and changed us. That's the thing. Math, if you translate something, you've changed it. You have, like as far as you've changed it from one <clears throat> spot into another. A language... If you translate, you change it from one language into another. It's different. Uh, it, it's in a different place. In other words, if we have been translated into the kingdom, that means the kingdom is now. It's not something we're looking forward to. The New Testament teaches 
that while Jesus was here, the kingdom was at hand. You never read that language again after Acts 2. The apostle Paul didn't preach the kingdom was at hand. The apostle Peter, after Jesus was ascended, didn't preach the kingdom was at hand. James didn't. Uh, the Hebrew writer didn't. John the apostle didn't. Anyone didn't teach about the kingdom being at hand after Acts 2. Up until that point it was, but not then. So the parable of the pounds was first and foremost about the kingdom not beginning while Jesus was here on this earth. That's lesson one. Lesson two was that Christ expects his servants to faithfully work in his kingdom. So these people, these ten servants, were given a job to do while the king went away to receive his kingdom. There was going, the kingdom was going to be, once he received it, they were going to be in it. They had work to do. He ex God ex Christ expects us to work. This isn't expecting too much. We're in Colossians. Let's go to Colossians 3, verse 17. And Tammy can get that. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay. Now we, we, we focus a lot on this all in the name of the Lord. Whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord, by the name of the Lord Jesus, by the authority of the Lord Jesus. We deal with that. But notice, whatever you do in word or deed, that means whatever you say, let it be done by uh, the authority of Jesus. Whatever you do, though, whatever you do, make sure you have the ability to say, I'm doing this by Christ's authority. We should never do anything doubting whether or not it's right whether or not it's wrong. We should always know what I'm doing is right. And we, if we know something is wrong, we better not do it. Uh, we should always know we have words and deeds. That tells us we are to work. It's not that, uh, it's not expecting too much. The wicked servant who did nothing with the money thought that it was too much to work. Some people think it's a lot of work to go out and try to spread the gospel. It's not as hard as people think it is. We don't have to go to the, each and every one of us doesn't have to go to the outer reaches. Doesn't have to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles. We travel to work every day. A lot of us do. Who do we meet along the way? We meet our coworkers. We, we, we meet, we meet uh, people maybe on the way to work. We stop for lunch maybe. All opportunities for us to lead by our example and perhaps teach others of the gospel. You may think, well, that's not glamorous. No. This man who, who had the one pound and did nothing with it didn't have to do a whole lot. The master didn't say to the one who had five pounds that he wasn't as good as the one who got ten pounds. He was happy with the person who got five pounds that he worked and got five pounds. If the person had only worked and got one pound, would the master have been happy based on what we know from this parable? Yes. Based on what we know from this parable, if the man had worked and only got one pound, even if he'd gotten half a pound, he worked. It's when he did nothing that well, that's what got him into trouble. He did nothing. He just took what he had and hid it almost. Uh, this is a lot like the parable of the talents that we'll deal with in a few weeks. It's not exactly the same, but it's a lot like the parable of the talents uh, in that way. But um, he, God expects us to work. Did you have something, Bill? No, I just wondered if, if by doing all in the name of the Lord Jesus uh, like implies to us a, a motivation of what he's done for us. Otherwise, why would we be giving thanks to God the Father? Yeah. Well, as far as uh, what he's done for us, we, 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 need to, we need to be giving thanks for what Jesus has done for us. We can't do anything by the authority of the Lord Jesus if Jesus hadn't died for us. We would still be in the state of sin. We would still be in the state of uh, eternal punishment in that sense. We need to give thanks to God for everything that we do. Uh, 
whatever we say, whatever we do, we need to give thanks for what God has done for us, for our abilities that God has provided for us, uh, for, for, because God is the provider of all things. He is the provider of life. He is the provider of all things. And we need to give thanks to God for all things, and we need to give thanks to God for Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to be thankful. God did not have to send his son to die for us. He did not have to. Sometimes we think he did. He didn't. Now, he was going to save us. He had to be faithful to himself. But God could have condemned us. God could have said, well, you sinned, you're lost. But he didn't do that. He sent Jesus Christ to die for us. That's a good point. Lesson number two. So that lesson number three is dealing with those other people. The other people, there are people who do not want Jesus to be king and rule over him. They reject his authority. Well, the Jews would fit into there. And so would anyone else who didn't accept Jesus Christ. So the Jews of that day were certainly fit into that parable. They didn't, they didn't want Jesus to rule over them. They kill him. We're not long until the end of Jesus' life. We're in Luke 19. Uh, and they were about to kill him because they didn't want him to rule over him. Today, same thing goes. There are people who say, I just don't believe in Jesus Christ for whatever reason. They are the people in these parables who rejected him. But that brings us to lesson four, that even though people reject him, that didn't prevent the nobleman from going and getting the kingdom and becoming king. He would still go away to receive the kingdom. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, I think we're to Naomi. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, and then verse 13. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels wind, wind and his ministers of flame with fire. 8 and then verse 13. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Okay, this is a picture of, of Jesus sitting on his throne. God saying, whom have I ever said these things to? Christ went away to receive the kingdom. He received it. He is king today. That's our fourth lesson. Moving to the back of the page, our fifth lesson. Fifth lesson, Jesus will judge us. Whether or not we fulfill our responsibilities and our work. Jesus has left us a work. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Some of us may go farther than others. But we all have to work. There is not one Christian who God will just give a pass to. You don't have to do anything. You, you, could, just, you could just be a, what I call a Sunday morning Christian. You just come to church every morning and that's it. We all have to do some work. Now some will be more than others. Some he has given us more abilities, more responsibilities. But we have to take what we have and we all have something. And work with it. But we're all going to be judged based on what we do or don't do. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, Henry, do you want to get verses 9 to 11? Therefore, we make each other a verse of prison absent to be real prison to him. We must now appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the tale, terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. Now I also trust are uh, well known in your conscience. Okay. We all are going to appear. Before the judgment seat of Christ. Not, there's not a single person, living or dead, that is going to escape this. There's no hiding in the corner. There's not hoping he misses us. We're all going to appear. How are we going to be judged? According to our 
according to what we've done. According to what we've done. Now, that doesn't say that, that we can earn salvation. That's not what this verse is saying. But, did we obey Jesus Christ? Did we obey him the way the scriptures say? There are many people today who think they've obeyed Jesus Christ. All they were told was, accept Jesus into your heart. Problem is, the scriptures don't say, don't say those words at all. But, second of all, the scriptures say we need to believe in Jesus. We need to repent of our sins, confess him as the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of our sins. God has commanded us to do those things. God has commanded us to work. This parable uh, taught the people, his ten servants, they were told to do something. If they did it, they, were, they had a reward. If they didn't do it, they were like that wicked servant. So if we come along and say, well, all I, I, I thought, you, you're, you're, a very, you're a very austere God. And I thought that I couldn't do, every, like as far as that, Perhaps that I couldn't do as well as this person does. So all I did was what I thought was the minimum. Well, if all we say we're just going to believe in Jesus Christ, believing is good, but it's not exactly what God commanded. We have to do exactly what God commands, not just our own version of it. I wish I could preach. All you have to do is believe. That's an easy gospel because I don't really have to do much. All I got to preach and all you got to say is believe. If that's what the scriptures taught, that's what we teach. It's not because I have some aversion to people uh, who teach this. It's because the scriptures teach more. Scriptures don't teach less. We have to have the gospel complete, not the gospel minus the parts we don't like. And so um, we have responsibilities. We have work to do whether it's work to obey God in the first place, or whether it's work to spread the kingdom of God uh, to all borders. And so that's our responsibility. We're going to be judged by that. We're going to be judged by that. And so we need to make sure we're working. God never accepts a lazy person. Never does. Uh, he commands us all the time. We need to work, not be lazy. Which brings us to our sixth lesson. Doing nothing is not acceptable. Coming along and saying, do it, I'm not going to do anything with what you gave me. It's just not acceptable. Uh, I think it's Bill. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, <clears throat> These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and thou art dead. Be thou watchful, and establish the things that remain, which were ready to die. For I have found no works of thine perfected before my God. Uh, three? Verse three, three, yes. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received, and didst hear, and keepeth, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Okay, church in Sardis was dead. <clears throat> Wasn't doing anything. That was a problem. Uh, there, can, there can be many churches that we might consider sound that Jesus does not because they're not doing anything. They're not spreading the gospel. Uh, they're not attempting to. Sometimes we might come along and say, well, they're not growing. But are they attempting? Are they attempting to spread the gospel? Sometimes growth is hard. Jesus wasn't mad and angry at the church at Sardis because they weren't growing. It's because they weren't attempting. They weren't doing anything. He says, you haven't done anything. We need to work. God will always demands that we work, that we attempt. Sometimes our attempts will be failures. Or maybe not be as successful as we want them to be. Maybe this man who had five pounds wanted more, but that's all he got. Well, brings us to our next, uh, well, I guess uh, I'll, I'll flip eight and seven because that does segue into our eighth lesson. Jesus was not displeased with the man who with one pound gained five, unlike the first man who gained 10. He didn't, he didn't, each one was judged according to his ability. 
and according to his opportunity. That's good news for us because some people just doesn't matter how hard they work, they won't they aren't as good or get the same results as somebody else. We don't have to compare ourselves to somebody else. Well, that person they they they, they had eight contacts. All I could get was two. Did you go out and work? Yes. That's fine. Your abilities, your opportunities got you too. Now they may not have panned out, but that's not saying the eight, the eight did the, from the first one either. But some people have more ability. Some people have more opportunity, but they both worked. Jesus wasn't displeased with the man, but Jesus also gives added responsibilities to those who can handle it. The man with 10 pounds received another pound. In other words, if we can handle the certain responsibilities, Jesus will give us more. So this also shows us that Jesus does take part in our lives. Uh, Jesus, it, Jesus and God is not, doesn't leave us completely alone. We're told to pray to God for the things that we have. We are to pray to God for strength and for faith. Doesn't require, doesn't mean that we that we get it without us doing anything. But God does assist us. We may not always see it, but he does. He assists us. And sometimes if we have more abilities, we find ourselves in situations where we can use our abilities more. And that's a good thing. Uh, so that's our eighth, eighth lesson. And our ninth one is Jesus will judge those who rejected him and his kingdom whether the Jews are of old uh, or modern people who will not become Christians or will not submit to his rule and authority. Tammy, you'll get Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. So, when he comes in the clouds, everyone's going to see him. Even the ones who thrust the spear through his side. And they're long dead. But everyone's going to see him. No one's going to hide. Those who do not submit to Jesus' authority will face punishment and judgment for not doing that. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Naomi. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexual immoral. Uh, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Okay. It's punishment. Eternal punishment. Those who are not faithful. The parable of the pounds. Those who do not accept Jesus as king will receive punishment. Those who do accept him as king but don't fulfill their duties will receive punishment. The wicked servant was in the same condition as those who rejected his authority. Should be that should be telling to us. We need to accept Jesus Christ, and we need to work in his kingdom. How do I accept Jesus Christ? Well, Mark 16, 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Belief is important. Acts 2, 38 says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Luke 13, 3 says, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repentance is important. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says, we need to believe in our heart the Lord Jesus and confess with our mouth. We need to confess. Confession is made to salvation. And Acts 22, 16 says, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. That's God's plan for salvation. But as the parable of the pounds shows, we need to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2, verse 10, to receive the crown. Belief, repentance, confession, and baptism is only the first step on the road to eternity. We can't stop walking. We can't come along and say, I'm too afraid. God's too severe. I just won't work. That's not acceptable. 